welcome everyone to the hands-on session. Okay, so Matteo and myself, we will take care of it. I, I start and then Matteo continue later on. So please uh, open Quantum Mobile, keep it ready for the hands-on. And also these are the slides. You can find these slides in day two. Yes, here it's called day two underscore hands-on.pdf. Okay, so yeah, we have three hours in total and we have one hour for lunch in between. So we have really lots of time and let's try to use it as effectively as possible. Okay, and this is the first exercise, uh, calculation of the projected density of states of cobalt oxide with and without the Hubbard U correction. This is the input file for cobalt oxide. So you're already familiar with the input file for the PW.X calculation in quantum espresso. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. Just very key points I would like to highlight. So this is the SCF calculation. So we say calculation equal SCF. Here we set up the structure, uh, eyebrow zero and the lattice parameter eight bore. So since we use eyebrow zero, it means we also need to set up the cell parameters below in a lot units, in units of the lattice parameter. And this is the cell parameters which were already optimized using the PBE sol functional. For cobalt oxide, we have four atoms, two cobalt atoms and one, uh, sorry, and two oxygen atoms. That's why uh, in the atomic positions, we see cobalt one and cobalt two and two oxygens. We have cobalt one and cobalt two, two types of oxygen, or sorry, of cobalt, because this system is spin polarized. So we have two sub lattices. So cobalt one corresponds to the spin up and cobalt two correspond to spin down. So that's why we use <clears throat> n spin equals to two to tell to the code that this is spin polarized calculation. And we set up starting magnetization for the first type, uh, some value in the range from zero to one, let's say 0 0.5. And for the second cobalt, starting magnetization minus 0 0.5, something between 0 and minus 1. So just to tell to the code that first cobalt has initial magnetization up, and the second cobalt has initial magnetization down, as we want, because it's antiferromagnetic uh, material. And then also we set occupations equal to smearing, because uh, we actually already know that at the PBSO level, cobalt oxide is metallic. However, experimentally, it is insulating. So since this is the PB salt calculation, we use smearing here. Convergence threshold is set to some uh, reasonable value, 10 to the power minus 10. And uh, pseudo potentials are also set here. They were generated using the PB salt function. So this is very basic. Uh, a brief reminder that uh, to prepare this kind of inputs, you can use Quantum Espresso Input Generator. That is a very useful tool. You can find it using the link below. And pseudopotentials were taken from the SSP pseudopotential library that can be also found in the materials cloud here. So we don't need to think which pseudopotentials to use. We simply go to this website and pick up <clears throat> the best, the most accurate pseudopotentials, which were tested against the all electron calculations. So on the left, we see the recap of the SCF calculation. And on the right, we have uh, a similar input file, but for the NSCF calculation, which means non salt consistent field calculation. There are a few differences in between the two inputs. Uh, first, we say calculation SCF or NSCF. And second, uh, in, the, in the NSCF input, we need to set the number of bands, the parameter N, B, and D equals to 40. This is so because we want to compute the projected density of states. So we want to have not only the occupied states, but only a few empty states. So why the value of 40? It depends on the system. Uh, because we already checked before that uh, you can see from the output of the SCF calculation 
what is the number of occupied states. Then you simply add a few more states to have a few empty states. So I will show you in a moment what does it mean. And for the K points, for the SCF, we use the three by three by three K point mesh. <clears throat> for the NSCF, denser K mesh, six by six by six. So why is it so? Because in SCF, we can use scarcer mesh because we simply need to converge the density. While in NSCF, we need to use a denser K mesh because we want to have very accurate projected density of states. If you want, you can use equally equal K point meshes like 666 in both cases. It will just make your SCF calculation more expensive, but you will not really gain much. So that's why it's sometimes useful to use SCF with scarcer K mesh and NSCF with denser K mesh. But be careful, those are not. Uh, well converged K meshes. This is just for test for the demonstration purposes. They are very scarce, but in general, you need to converge both K meshes. Once these two calculations are done, and this will be we will do it in a, in a moment. After that, the third calculation is the projected density of states calculation using the program uh, project wave functions proj wfc. The input is here. It's pretty simple. The prefix and output directory is exactly the same as in the previous two uh, inputs. You see prefix and, and uh, out directory. Then we need to specify a few other keywords like and Gauss. This is to tell to the code that this is Gaussian broadening, the value of the broadening, the Gauss in Rydberg, the energy window for the PDOS, and the step delta E. And then I already prepared to you the GNU plot script called plot underscore pidos dot gp, where is all ready. You just need to run this GNU plot script to produce the, the final image. So this is the steps, and let's do it now. So we go now to Quantum Mobile to day two. In day two, we go to exercise one. Here we see readme.md. If you type cat with me, you see all these steps. And let's do them one by one. First, the uh, self-consistent field calculation. Uh, Yuri, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Um, there's probably a mistake in the fact that NSCF and SCF uh, uh, inputs have different cell parameters from one another. Okay, uh, also in the in the slides. Uh, oh yes. And some some attendees are realizing that, and I was I was looking at that also. Oh okay okay thank you. So maybe yes. we in the in the end on tutorial we we just fix that. Yes yes thank you yeah uh, it's a mistake sorry. Yes indeed thank you. Yes yeah, so we need to change cell parameters in the NSCF calculation here. Okay, so now we are running SCF. Let's open the output file because I would like to that we see uh, some useful information here. So if we go at the bottom of this output file, we see as usual total energy, Fermi energy, Total magnetization is zero, as it should be, because it's anti ferromagnet. But also, I would like to show you the output. Oh, no, there is nothing here. So, okay, I'll show you later. So, this is standard uh, DFT calculation. Now, we need to modify a little bit the NSCF. So, let's first open the SCF input file, copy cell parameters. It's actually, I did it on purpose so that you learn a little bit how to modify the input. No, I'm just kidding. And here we remove the old cell parameters. Okay, we paste exactly the same as we see. Okay, we save. Okay, now, yeah, I can actually answer the question why we have 40 bands here. So to answer that, we open the previous output file, cobalt oxide SCF output. 
And at the top of this page, we go to the summary of the calculation. And here you will see number of concern states 28. So this is the number of occupied states. So it's 28. I want to have a few more empty states. So I decided to take 12. You can take whatever number you like. Typically, I mean, we need to converge the PDOS up to some certain energy. So if you go to higher energy, you need to have more empty states. So here we say just for demonstration purpose, 12 states. So that's why it is 40, but it can be 30, it can be 50, whatever you decide. Now we run the NSCF calculation. Cobalt oxide dot NSCF dot in and output cobalt oxide NSCF dot out. And we press enter. Okay, you see, we have 64 K points and the code runs one by one sequentially. So it takes a little bit of time. While waiting, maybe we can take some questions. So how is starting magnetization decided? Starting magnetization, yes, it's any value in the range from zero to plus one and from zero to minus one. So any value. So in principle, the result, the final result should not depend on this value, but in some ex some exotic systems, it might result. If you have many local minima, so if you set up a, set up different starting magnetization, your calculation can converge to different uh, local minima. But if your system is pretty simple and it don't have complex potential energy surface, you choose just some fractional value between zero plus one and zero minus one and it should not matter really which exact value you take. Okay, the calculation took uh, one minute, 13 seconds. Okay, next step is to run the projected density of state calculation using the program PROJ WFC. So we read the input, cobalt oxide dot wfc dot in, and we write the output, cobalt oxide wfc dot out. So this is the PDOS calculation. It's fast. Yes, it took just three seconds. And finally, so you see the this calculation produced many files here. So each file corresponds to the projection of the quantum wave functions on certain atomic orbitals. For example, for cobalt one, we have uh, five files because in the pseudo potential, we have five atomic orbitals. So they're labeled one, two, three, four, five. And see, here you see the character of those orbitals, S, P, D, S, P. We are interested in the D orbitals. So that's why we will only plot the information from this file for the 3D orbitals of cobalt one. And same for cobalt two, we will take information from this file, cobalt two 3D orbitals. And for oxygen, we take uh, 2P orbitals. So if you are familiar with GNU plot scripts, it's, so the script is plot PDOS. So we already, Prepare everything here, but you can find here that we use information from those files that I just commented about. So for cobalt one and cobalt two 3D states, and for oxygen 2P states. So we plot three uh, graphs on the same plot. So we simply type GNU plot and the name of the script plot underscore pdos dot gp. It takes one second and produces the file called cobalt oxide underscore PDOS. We open it with the program called Evans. Cobalt oxide underscore PDOS dot EPS. And this is our final result. So here we see on the y axis projected density of states. 
on the x-axis we have energy in electron volts this energy was shifted by the value of the Fermi level so this energy of the Fermi level was taken from the output of the SCF calculation and we see in red cobalt 3d states for the majority spin this is cobalt 1 and then we in the green we show cobalt 3d minority states this is cobalt 2 and we see in blue oxygen 2p states so you should also obtain exactly the same figure if you have any problems please uh, tell us on slack so now i come back to the presentation if i go too too fast please tell me i i slow down a little bit okay so this is the result that we just obtained obtained so what we find is that DFT predicts cobalt to be metallic, which is obviously wrong because experimentally it is known to be insulating. So we want to have to see some bang gap, but we don't see it. This is because we use PBSO. We know there are self-interaction errors. 3D states are over delocalized and we see the calculation gives completely wrong prediction. And plus U comes to the rescue. Let's try to use DFT plus U and see if we manage to open the bank gap. Now what we do is take in our original input files and we need to modify them slightly. All stays exactly the same as before. We just need to add a new card, which is called Hubbard card which is shown at the bottom. Let me zoom in and explain in more detail each information in this card. So here it is. So first, the name of the card, which is Hubbard, written in capital letters. Then in brackets, we write the type of Hubbard projector functions that we just explained in the lecture. You can have atomic, orthoatomic. It's the most frequently used ones. Here we use orthoatomic. Then we say the letter of the Hubbard parameter, it's U, or it can be V. In this case, it's U. Then we say to which chemical elements we want to apply the Hubbard U correction. In our case, it's cobalt 1 and cobalt 2. And then we stay, say which states of these chemical elements we want to correct with Hubbard U, because both cobalts, cobalt 1 and cobalt 2, they have five atomic orbitals. 3D, 3P, 3S, etc. So in principle, we can apply Hubbard correction to any of those. But in our case, we want to correct only 3D states. So that's why we write cobalt 1 slash 3D, cobalt 2 slash 3D. And finally, we put the value of the Hubbard parameter. In this case, it's 6.3 and 6.3. It is exactly the same for two cobalt atoms. Because these two cobalt atoms only differ by, by spin. But apart from that, the value of the Hubbard U is the same. Now, why this value of Hubbard U? Uh, here, we just want to, to show you how it does it work. But later on, we will show you how to compute it. So suppose we already know how to compute it. We did it. Now we just plug in here the value, which is 6.3 in our case. And then just we want to see if it opens the bank gap or not. But later, I will show you how to compute it. So yes, and the same for the uh, NSCF input file. We need to add the Hubbard card and keep in mind that we need to fix the problem for cell parameters. The input file for the PDOS calculation does not change. It stays exactly the same. And the script for GNU plot also stays the same. I think we just need to change the, the Fermi energy, but if we don't, it's, yeah, we need to change the Fermi energy. So let's do that. So the value is 6.3, let's remember this. So here we can clean uh, this repository. We can remove the this all these output files. We can write R, but be careful, don't remove too much. Rm star dot out so we remove those then we remove the dos output files 
it's not uh, strictly necessary to remove it. They will be overwritten if you don't remove them, but I just prefer to remove them. Have a clean repository. And we can also remove the temporary directory. So R I R M minus R F N T N P. Okay, so we have clean repository. Now we can modify the input files. So here we go at the bottom of this input file, and we need to type Hubbard card. The type of Hubble projectors orthoatomic. And then we need to specify that we apply Hubbard U to Cobalt 1 slash 3D states and the value of U6.3. Okay. <clears throat> and same for the second Cobalt. So we just type Cobalt, change Cobalt 1 to Cobalt 2. That's it. So this we copy and paste also in the NSCF input. This will close and save. Column WQ. Now we open the NSCF output. Go at the bottom and paste the Hubbard card that we just typed in the, NSC, in the SCF input. <laughs> Okay, that's the only modification. Now we need to repeat the same steps before as before. PW.x with the input from cobalt oxide scf.input and write output scf.out. I press enter. The calculation is running. So there is a question, particular reason for choosing MV smearing. So MV smearing is the Marzari Vanderbilt or also known as cold smearing. This is uh, the most accurate type of smearing. Another popular one is uh, Methfessel Buxton, but that has some issues uh, because it can allow negative uh, occupancies, which doesn't make any physical sense. So Marzari Vanderbilt is more accurate. That's why we strongly recommend to use it. So what would happen if the starting magnetization is set by error to a value more than 1.0 or less than minus 1.0? It will simply stop. The code does not allow it. Okay, the SCF is finished. Now we need to do NSCF. Function PWX, we read the input for NSCF and write the output in NSCF.out. Again, it takes some time. So while waiting for this, we can inspect the output file of the SCF calculation. So I open a second terminal. Okay. Now let's open the output file SCF calculation. Go at the bottom. So we can see that total magnetization is still zero. So it's still anti-ferromagnet as it should be. We have the, the Fermi energy written here. But also now in the output, we have extra information here. Let me just get to the last occurrence of this. So the, in, the, in the output file, we see, uh, since we are running the FT plus two calculation, the code prints some extra information. In particular, the information about the Hubbard occupations. So we have two Hubbard atoms, cobalt one and cobalt two. That's why we have information for atom one and below for atom two. What is reported here is the trace of the occupation. So occupation matrix called NS, and this is the trace. So this tells us how many electrons are sitting in the 3D 
shell of cobalt. So we have upspin component, which is 4.96, downspin component, which is 2.28, and the total, which is the sum of the two, which is 7.25. Also, the code reports the atomic magnetic moment, which is 2.68 magneton bore. And then for each spin, it reports more information. So we have for spin one, this block, and for spin two, the second block. So for spin one, we have the original occupation matrix before the diagonalization, it's here. So it is five by five matrix because we are dealing with 3D electrons. So that's the, why we have the dimension five by five. Because the orbital quantum number is two. So we can have five values from, from minus L to plus L. And, and we can see that we have on the diagonal some values. And if we take the sum of those values, we obtain uh, this number, 4.96. But you can notice that there are also some very small off diagonal values. In this case, they're really negligible, but in other cases, it can be very significant. And when we diagonalize this matrix, we obtain the eigenvalues reported here and the corresponding eigenvectors. And the same we have for spin two. So we see that spin up channel is occupied because all eigenvalues are close to one while the spin down channel is, uh, so the three eigenvalues are essentially empty, while the other two are occupied. For the, if you do the same analysis for the second cobalt, you will see that it is reversed, but the, because the spin is opposite. So we have that for the spin one, the first three empty and the last two are occupied, while, while for the second spin, all is occupied. So it's really mirrored. So this information is extremely useful. Whenever you use DFT plus U, it's always very useful to check this information. Okay, so the NACF calculation is finished. Now we do the third step, which is the PDOS calculation. So we type proj wfc.x with the information from the input and write the results in the output. This takes just a few seconds. And the final step is to run the GNU plot script. But since we applied the plus U correction, the Fermi energy has changed. So we should modify it in the script. So we go back to the SCF input. Sorry, it's already opened. So the value of the Fermi energy is 15.62, 15.62. Let's put it in the script. Okay, here it is. So here we have this shift, 15.62. It's on three lines to modify. All the rest stays the same. We save it. And now we can run the GNU plot script. This produced the file cobaltoxidepdos.eps. We can visualize it with Evin's problem. And this is the result. We are very happy because thanks to the plus U correction, there is a bang gap that was opened. So now we get, can go back to the slides. Yeah, so there is a band gap opened, which is very good because this is in agreement with experiments because experimentally there is a band gap. So now let's recap again. In DFT, we didn't have a gap, we had a metal. By applying plus U, we opened the gap. The experimental value of the band gap is 2.5 plus minus 0.3 V. And with DFT plus U, 
we predict 2.6, which falls in the experimental uncertainty, which is very good. So, of course, this band gap depends a lot on the value of the, of the Albert U parameter. So, in this case, we used 6.3 because I performed self consistent calculation of the Hubbard U and I obtained that it is 6.3. And as you can see with this ab initio value on the Hubbard U parameter, we predict the band gap, which is very good in very good agreement of experiments. It not, not always we have this such a good band gap, but in this case, it is very good. And we will compute this value of the Hubbard U uh, in the afternoon. So how are we doing in terms of time? We have still half an hour. Okay, this is great because I can do, we can do now together the second exercise for, for iron oxide. And then Matteo will continue with exercise three and exercise four, either during this half an hour or after the lunch break. So, okay, now uh, let's move to exercise two. A any questions so far that, that were not answered on Slack? There is one last which was not answered yet. DFT plus U produce band gap of cobalt oxide. Should we use occupations fixed? Well, here, since we are running uh, <clears throat> magnetic calculation, spin polarized calculation, we're obliged to use occupation smearing because we need to allow to the code to use fractional occupations. So if you put occupations fixed, and try to use starting magnetization, the code will stop. You say, you can't, you need to use smearing. So that's the answer. So it's it's a technical uh, reason why we need to use smearing because we use spin polarized calculation. We perform star, uh, spin polarized calculation. Okay, let's uh, move on. So nicely, we, we saw that for cobalt oxide, plus you opens a gap without any issues straightforwardly. But you will see now that in iron oxide, it's more tricky. So let's see what's happening. So this is the input file for iron oxide. It is uh, essentially exactly the same as for cobalt oxide. I just re-optimized it at the PBSO level. So cell parameters are somewhat different. Here they coincide because I didn't do a mistake here. Uh, so we just, uh, again, perform standard DFT calculation. So you will already know the procedure. I just I would like to say that before, when we performed DFT calculation, there was no Hubbard card. But here we put it with the some vanishing Hubbard U parameter. So we do so just because we want the code to print in the output the information about the Hubbard occupations. because we want to do some analysis. But in principle, we don't really need this Hubbard card when we want standard DFT calculation. And the following steps, PDOS calculation and script are the same as before. So yes, we do these steps, let's do them. Now we go to exercise two. So we go to exercise two. We already discussed the input files. Let's just check that all is as expected. Ah, here actually I, for, I removed the Hubbard card. So we need to add it. Let's add it. Hubbard orthonomic U iron one 3D states. 0.0001. It's same for the second iron. Okay. And exactly the same Hubbard card we need to add to the NSCF calculation. Over here. Okay, so now we are ready to run all the five steps. So first the ground state calculation.
okay this is now standard dft calculation or if you want dft plus u with, with vanishing hubbard u parameter which is essentially standard dft but you see the code outprints uh, information about hubbard occupations which we want to know what, what is the occupations in a dft case Okay, takes uh, some time. About 20 seconds, I think. Okay, the SCF has finished. Now we can run the NSCF calculation. This takes a bit more of time. So we should obtain again the metallic solution as shown here. Any questions on Slack? I, do, I see all was answered. Okay, so let's uh, wait for this population to finish. So we should obtain this result, metallic solution, as in the case of cobalt oxide, which is obviously wrong. So next, what we want to try is, is in case of cobalt oxide, we want to apply some Hubbard U correction. In this case, we choose the value of, well, we not choose, we actually compute it from first principles. I did it so consistently, and I obtained the value of 5.36. In the case of cobalt oxide, this was 6.3. So you see the value of the Hubbard U depends on the chemical element and in the environment and many factors. So we do SCF and NSCF with the Hubbard U correction. And what we, we should find that there is no band gap, it is still metallic. So for some reason, in the case of cobalt oxide, it was enough just to apply Hubbard U, it opens the gap. But here, surprisingly, we applied Hubbard U and there is no band gap opening. So what is the problem? So let's first finish these calculations just to, to be sure that this is indeed the case. So this is the uh, standard DFT, which is being finished soon. Okay, the next step is uh, PDOS calculation. It's fast. Then again, we check the value of the thermal energy because we need to make sure that in the script it is correct. So we open the SCF output and check the Fermi energy is 16.11. So we open the group plot script, 16.11, that's correct. So we can run this script without any modification. So we type group plot, the name of the script, plot underscore PDOS. This produces the EPS file. Or just was not the eye but there is okay with dft we obtain metallic solution as expected 
that's fine. Now we want to run the standard DFT plus C calculation. So let me keep these files. Let me create a directory uh, DFT and move there and copy these files there. So I don't, don't want to lose them. Okay, now I can clean this repository. All right, and one more, yes. Okay, now we want to run DFT plus. Let's input the Albert U values in the input. So first is CF. We put here the value of five dot, what was it? Five dot 36 for both iron types. And the same for the NSCF, five dot 36. Okay, now let's repeat all steps again. Okay, take some time. So the question, sorry, why you have to use the Fermi level of the SCF instead of the NSCF calculation? So, Actually, yesterday there was a similar question, and I answered to it. Uh, so, the Fermi energy of SCF and NCF they should uh, coincide. If I mean, if you use dense enough K point mesh in both cases, they will coincide. If they don't coincide, it means some some of them is not converged. In this case, the one of SCF because the K mesh is scarce. But if you use dense enough K-mesh, both Fermi energies should coincide. So it doesn't really matter if you take it from SCF or NCF because it is the same. In this case, they don't because it's not converged because we don't have time to, to run very expensive calculations. But for demonstration purposes, it's enough. It's not really a big deal if it's not converged. It's really sufficient for us to discuss what we want to discuss. But for the when you want to publish results, you need really to perform careful convergence tests. Sorry, Yuri, there was uh, someone who was asking to uh, showing the Hubbard correction value again for FE. Showing it was too value. quick and yeah. You mean 5.36? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's, it's on the slides, by the way. So the slides are provided with the hands-on, so all this information should be available to everyone. But yes, please, 5.36 in the case of iron. It's a self-consistent value, which was also computed by us. Okay, self-consistent so calculation is still running. Almost there. We have 15 minutes left, so we will finish this exercise and go for a break. So now we do the NSCF calculation. So as we know, this takes a bit more time. Let's uh, be patient. Meanwhile, let's answer some questions. So which type of Hubble projector was used in the older versions of quantum espresso, like 6.1, 6.5? As far as I remember, it was not possible to specify the Hubble projector in older versions. So before, in the older versions and in the current latest version, the default is atomic, which means non-orthogonalized atomic orbitals. 
Uh, now we really are obliged to specify explicitly in the input which type of other projectors you used. Before, if you don't specify, it's fine. You just use the default, which is atomic. But now we want that people really realize actually what do they use. Before it was like assumed silently that you use atomic, and people didn't really care, pay much attention to this. But now people are uh, obliged to pay attention to this. You need really to, to write the input atomic or orthoatomic. And in the older versions, you still could choose. There was a parameter called U projection type. It was atomic or off atomic. As I say, it was not uh, mandatory to specify it always, because if you don't specify anything, it was the default value, which was atomic. But now this doesn't work. There is no default. You really need to specify it. So could you please tell me, uh, there is someone answering. Okay, maybe I'll let people answer in Slack. So the non u DFT PDOS you obtained in the run was slightly different than the one in day two PDF file. Mix around the Fermi energy. Is this just because of changing settings? Yes, probably there is some slight mismatch. Yes, and maybe when I was preparing slides, what I put on slides and what I put here slightly mismatch. Apologies. But I, I don't expect there should be some very, very big differences. Okay, MSCF is finished. Now let's run the PDOS calculation. This is fast. And uh, okay, now before we run the glue plot, let's check again the thermal energy. It's 16.67. 16.67. We put it here. So we shift the PDOS by this energy. Now we are ready to run the new plot script. And we can visualize the PDOS. Okay. So this is the metallic solution. And to check the slides, they're more or less the same. So yes, we see that simply applying plus U blindly does not open the gap. So what is the problem and what to do? And this we answer in the remaining 10 to 15 minutes. So the problem is that in iron oxide, uh, unfortunately, uh, we converge to the local minimum. And this local minimum is metallic. But instead, we want to converge to the global minimum, which is insulating. So essentially, the code didn't manage automatically to converge directly to the global minimum, it got stuck in some local minimum. This can happen, and this is one of those unfortunate cases. So what to do in this case? Uh, we need to do some trick, if we can say it like that. So we need to inspect the output file and check the Albert occupations and try to understand what's happening. So this is the screenshot of the output file of the DFT plus U calculation. So as I said, atom one is iron one in red, and atom two is iron two in green. So we see the spin up, spin one or spin up for first iron is fully occupied channel. You see eigenvalues are almost all equal to one, but for the second uh, spin two or down spin channel, uh, it's partially occupied. You see. The first two are the generate eigenvalues, are 0 0.075. Then we have another two degenerate values, equal 0 0.253. And the last one, which is non-degenerate, which is 0 0.285. So the second atom, it's exactly the same, but uh, mirrored. 
with respect to the spin channels. So I highlight here in blue circles these eigenvalues. They are the only ones that are not degenerate. And what we want to do now is to uh, try to suggest to the code to fully occupy them. So instead of having 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.285, we want to have one. So what we want is that the code converges to the solution where this last eigenvalue is fully is equal to one. So this state is fully occupied. So if you want to learn more about this, I mean, the physics behind why do we want this to be occupied, you can check the, the paper by, written by Matteo and Stefan de Gironcoli, Physical UB, 2005, the paper that introduces the linear response calculation of U. It's discussed in more detail, and maybe Matteo can comment later. But what I want to show you now, that is how to force the code to occupy this eigenvalue. I mean, to, to, to make it equal to one. And why this eigenvalue? This is because this is the only eigenvalue which is non-degenerate. The others are degenerate, so we don't want to touch them. So we want to push it to one. And how to do that? We have a keyword, which is called starting NS eigenvalue. And it depends on three indices and equals to some value. So some value is the value which we want to enforce. So it's one. Now, these three indices are what? The first, which is five, is the, the index of the eigenvalue which we want to, to change. In this case, it's the fifth eigenvalue. If you count one, two, three, four, five. So we want to change the fifth eigenvalue. Second index is spin. In this case, it's two. So for the first atom, it's the second spin channel. So we say spin two. And the last index is the atomic type. In this case, it's atom one which is iron one, is the first atomic type, so we put one. While for the second atom, we say the atomic type two, first spin channel, because it's in spin one, and again, it's the fifth eigenvalue. So we need to specify these two new keywords, and uh, what it will do, do, it's basically from after the first iteration, the code will uh, sort of try to, to converge to the to the solution where this eigenvalue is one, sort of hinting to the code, please try this this path. So this is how it looks like in the SCF and NSCF input. We need to add these two keywords. And okay, I wanted to keep it as a surprise, but let's try to do that and see if this works. Okay, we close this. So let's uh, save these files. So we copy everything there. And let's clean up this repository. Okay, we are good. Now let's modify the inputs, go here, and now we add these keywords, starting NS eigenvalue. So it was the fifth eigenvalue, well, the second spin channel for the first atomic type, and the fifth second value for the first spin channel, the second tonic type. And this we need to copy also in the NSCF calculation. We save. We open the NSCF input. And we paste here. Okay. And we repeat those steps as usual. So first we run the SCF calculation. Okay. So let's wait. The SCF is pretty quick. OK, 
Okay, so once this is finished, we can analyze the output file and see what the code does actually. So if the pseudo potential, there is a question in Slack. If the pseudo potential is produced with two D manifolds and one is empty, how can I apply the U correction? So now in Quantum Espresso, sorry, before I answer, let me submit NSC application. So we don't lose time. So now in Quantum Espresso, it is not allowed to apply the Hubbard U correction to empty states. So you can apply only to occupied states. Still, if you want to do it, there are ways how to do it. Uh, you can, from the input, there is a new keyword called Hubbard Oak. And it's written like this, Hubbard Oak. You can check the documentation. So basically, you can slightly cheat in the sense that you change the occupation from exactly 0 to 0 0.1. So the code will still allow to apply the Hubbard correction. So if you have two Hubbard channels and both of them are D, so you can act with the Hubbard on both of them. You just need to say which manifold, like you write in the input, let's say, let me show it here. Just a second. Yes, suppose we have iron one 3D. And then suppose we have an iron one, but another D. Okay, it doesn't make sense. But suppose we have 4D, I mean, it's empty, okay? So you can apply a different new value. But if it's fully empty, it will not work. So you will need to add here another keyword. equals let's say zero one. It's the occupancy of this manifold. So we need to say which atomic type. It's the first atomic type. And then the the channel. Yeah. So we have two Hubbard channels. So the first one is 3D because it appears first. And we want to change the second one. So we need to put second channel. I don't remember in which order. It's first the atomic type and then the type channel or vice versa. So we need to change the documentation. I don't remember. Probably it's the correct. Yeah. First atomic type, which is iron one, and second channel. So just say occupancy 0 0.1. So the code will, will run. If not, it will not run because it's not allowed to apply the U correction to fully empty states. Okay, but just to wrap up this session, uh yeah, and SCF is finished. We run the PDOS calculation. So, Dodge WFC, no, input. The output. Okay, and and we check the Fermi energy. Okay, did some mistake, I guess. Yes, I forgot to put oxygen. It's like a big problem. So the Fermi energy is 1595. So we put here. 1995. Okay. Okay, and now we run the script. And we open the the dust. And bingo, we open Venga, magic. So with this trick, we managed to open the bang gap. And the bang gap value is 2.76.
experimental one is 2.4. So you see, we overestimate. It's not perfect. It's not too bad, I would say. If DFT gives you, I think, much worse bang gap. I don't remember what is the value, but with DFT plus you, we improve a lot with respect to DFT, but still we are not very accurate. So in cobalt oxide, it was great. Now it's less great. It's, that's how it works. But the very important message, uh, as I already said before, on the left, we see the standard DFT plus U calculation and the total energy. And on the right, the DFT plus U is the trick of starting an S eigenvalue. But if you compare the total energies, you will see that the one on the right is lower, which means it's the really the global minimum. One on the left is higher, which means it's a local minimum. So as I said before, if you st run standard DFT plus equation, you're getting a local minimum. With this trick, you manage help to decode to find the global minimum and you open a gap. And then there is a new exercise about chromium oxide and Matteo will discuss about it uh, after the lunch break, but you will see what do we have in the case of chromium oxide. Is it as good as, I mean, is it as, we are so lucky in the case of cobalt oxide, or maybe we're less lucky like in iron oxide or it's some other scenario, but you will see. Okay, any other questions so far before we stop or close this session? So, okay, actually Nicole is asking, can you still open the gap with the trick even without the plus U? I, I think no, I haven't tried, but I think it will not work. So could you please tell us if uh, there is any possibility to calculate Hans coupling with quantum espresso? So Jay, it's a long story. So in 2011, Matteo and co-workers published a paper where they compute J for uh, copper oxide. And it really improved a lot the, the results, but it was a non-magnetic calculation. But if you try to compute for magnetic systems, it's difficult to converge the J parameter. Also, there are some issues with the functional but DFT plus U plus J functional, which was derived. It's still an open question and uh, researchers are working on that. In particular, Edward Linscott, who is one of uh, the lecturers and tutors, they put on archive a very a new functional that sort of tries to address this issue. And by the way, also Edward and uh, David Oregon, they actually also have a somewhat different version of linear response that allows to compute the J parameter. But now currently in quantum espresso, we don't have a uh, ready to use uh, code to compute J. Okay, any other questions or maybe we sh can wrap up here before the exercise three after the lunch break. Uh, just uh, one thing, someone asked this question that um, as the U parameter is the multi-minima problem, what can we do for complicated materials? Suppose for those materials that the non-degenerate fractional, uh, fractional occupation is not obvious. Yeah, it's a very good question. I think uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Louis, should be here around, but he cannot talk. He can maybe answer on Slack, but they work uh, on this problem. I mean, I just showed you the trick with starting an S eigenvalue, but uh, what they do, uh, they use DFT plus U with constraints. Ah, here it is. Maybe, Louis, do you want to take this question? He's there, but maybe not there. He went out. Okay, so basically, yeah, they use the constraints and they can explore really the potential energy surface. They find uh, really plenty of uh, local minima. And yeah, they sort of, with their method, they are able to find the lowest energy magnetic configurations. 
they should have a paper on archive soon, or maybe it's already on archive. So maybe you can check Louis Ponet and Nicola Marzari. But it's really, really interesting question. And uh, yeah, people are working on that. Maybe after the lunch break, Louis can comment more about this. Okay, do the DFT plus U calculations work well with the non-collinear calculations or, or with spin or B coupling? That's another excellent question. And there is another colleague, uh, Luca Binci, who should be also around. I don't know if he's there or not. But he implemented the non-collinear version of DFT plus U. Also, the HP code was extended to this case. So yes, uh, it's possible. It's not yet public, but it should be public in the near future, maybe in the, one of the future releases of Quantum Express, including spinal coupling. They already applied it to some uh, manganese containing compounds, and it was really improving a lot of the results. Okay, maybe the last question, and we stop here. Uh, how starting NS eigenvalues affect so largely the result bank gap? When should we include it? So, how does affect so largely the result? Well, it's because it simply allows us to converge to different minimum. I mean, without that trick, we get to the local minimum. With that trick, we get to the global minimum. And the difference is uh, huge. Either it's metallic or insulating ground state. But what it what it does under the underneath is that uh, if you open the STF output um, and then you go to the first iteration, yes, iteration one. So before iteration one, the code somehow redistributes electrons on the three D shell. But then, yeah, it's you see how it's redistributed. Uh, but then after the first iteration, since you ask the code to, to change the eigenvalues, there is this warning. Modifying starting an S matrices according to input values. So you see that here we have the fifth eigenvalue exactly one because we asked from the input, we, we asked it to be one. You see also here. Okay. So for us, starting from this first iteration, the code is already sort of kicked in the different direction and it tries to go that direction and it manages to go to the global minimum. But if you don't do the trick, the code alone doesn't manage to, to get to the global minimum. So this is the eigenvalue that was changed. Yeah, you can simply open the output and check that it worked well and in the sense that the code did modify the eigenvalue. Okay, I don't want to take more of your time. I think we should close this session.